preach the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of the wall. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, whenever you start a message, oh, boy. That, that, you, know, you know it's coming. You're in trouble. You're, you're all in trouble now. I have really prayed about whether I need to share what I'm about to share with you, and um, I told God the answer is no, and, um, but, but that usually doesn't work out too well for me. Um, so what I'm going to do is share with you a little story, and I'm going to be actually sharing the details of this story in probably the third week of, of January, because it goes better with the passage that I'm planning on sharing. October 16th, 2017, I'll never forget it. Um, that particular uh, uh, day was midweek, I believe, and I had received a very discouraging phone call, and um, having to do with ministry and all that kind of stuff. And as a pastor, you, you tend to internalize things very much so when someone is struggling or when someone is hurting. Um, you know, I, I have a, um, a problem in which I own your stuff, you know. If Hannah were to call me one day and say, man, I'm really de dealing deeply with this one situation, I tend to put that on my own shoulders. And I'm the kind of person, even in my own marriage, I want to fix it, you know. And um, often uh, my wife doesn't want me to fix it, she wants me to listen. And that's, an, that's the average husband, really. That's it's the way men are wired. Like, don't tell me about it unless, unless you want me to fix it, you know. That's not exactly parallel with the situation that was going on this day, but it definitely is a part of the mindset. October 16th, 2017 is something that I've never actually talked about in public, because it happened to be a day in which I actually hit rock bottom in discouragement. Um... It's, it's a day that I had to get on my knees and say, God, why? Why have you done this to me? I went home that day. I was at work, and I was kind of in the midst of it at work. And um, I, just, I just opened up to my wife, because for me, I'm the strong one, you know? I'm the one that you call... It's going to be a Kleenex message today. <laughs> Actually, it's going to be a message sponsored by Kleenex. <laughs> it was one of those days in which I had to go home and say, okay, listen, this is something I've been dealing with for a little while. And I need to be open. And there was no morality situation going on here. It wasn't like I had been doing something bad or whatever the case may be. It's just... It's just I have been chipped away and worn away for so long that I have not told anyone about it. And there was something cathartic about standing in front of my wife and saying, I'm not as strong as you think I am. 
I put on this front and I uh, and I and I and I kind of exposed myself to my wife and emotionally and spiritually and just saying, you know, I tell you that I am happy and, and that I am uh, you know have a smile on my face all the time, but on the inside I'm I'm being torn apart. And from then on out, God blessed me with such spiritual growth that it was like off the charts. I mean, well, you know, I can't, I can't claim off the charts, but you know what I'm saying. It was as if that there was this period of time in which God needed to break me for me to grow. As if, as if the... Um, <coughs> Something happened in which he had to say, you need to quit relying on yourself. At that, around that same time, I had contacted strategic people in my life and said, hey, would you pray for me? Because and I'm not going to give you the details, and you know, I just need you to look me up right now. And there's this cool story in, um, in the Old Testament in which Moses, the leader of, you know, of the Israelite people, is leading his people in battle. And um, you know, he, basically God said that whenever you raise your arms, take your staff up and raise your arms. And as long as your arms are up, your people will be winning this war. And when you lower them, you'll see a recession. So, Moses did the best thing he could. All this strength is put into that. And what had happened was, a couple of his buddies, and I'm just kind of glossing over a lot of detail in this story, but a couple of his buddies, you know, decided that they were going to be the ones to hold his arms up for him. I'm just going to be real honest and say, as a pastor, I need people to hold up my arms for me. And what, I, what I've realized is when people hold up my arms, things happen. Now, one of the things I've realized is some of the best ministry, <coughs> transition to the talk of ministry here, that happens in the church is not my initiation. It's people are coming up to me and saying, hey, I think that this needs to happen over here. Some of the worst ministry happens whenever things are put on my shoulders. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I, I did great in coming up with the idea of starting a church, in my opinion. <clears throat> but from that point on, it hasn't been hardly anything I've done. You know. I can't tell you how incredibly grateful I am when someone comes up to me and says, well, first of all, let me just say this. Um, as a pastor, you have to be very self-aware of the things that you can do and can't do or shouldn't be doing and should be doing, you know? So there are so many times where someone, mostly in the back corner over here, has come up to me and said, you're not really good at this. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> You know, and that is the most spiritually enlightening and enhancing thing that's up. Now, I'm not saying I invite you to come. <laughs> what did you say? You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I am not inviting you to come and just kind of drag me through the mud. But what I am saying is that sometimes we have to be self aware as human beings with the things that we can't do on our own and the things that we should be doing. So October 16th, like I said, I'm not getting into a huge amount of detail because uh, there's still some preparations and, and some message that I want to really put around that I think is going to be exciting. Um, the, I was at Rock Bottom. And the strategic people that I called upon really prayed for me not knowing what the situation was. And I just said, hey, listen, I... I put on a, uh, a good front, you know, as if everything was fine. But, but God wanted me to start asking for people to hold my arms up. So, from that point on, God 
poured into me like I had never been poured into before. I had a whole new interest for deep, diving deep into his word. Apart from, hey, I'm a pastor, I'm paid to do this, you know. Uh, hungry for his movement. Even more self-aware than before. Like, hey, you know, um, people need to start stepping up. I'm going to be honest with you. People need to start stepping up and saying, hey, you know what, I'm called to ministry. And you're called to ministry not because you have a degree or you went to seminary. You're called to ministry because Christ is in you. Uh, that wasn't big enough. You're, you're called to ministry because Christ is in you. Amen. I'll see you the second time. Maybe Amen. Time. Amen. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so sometimes we as Christians get to this point in which we have people surrounding us and we realize uh, that the responsibility, and here, here we go with a little bit of finger pointing. I'm going to point a finger because all of them are pointing at me, that we have to rely on one another and obviously God first and foremost to bring about re restoration, to bring about redemption, to bring about healing. Yes. I was uh, injured. And this was also around another, another time period. This is on camera, so I'm going to be very sensitive for how I'm going to put this. In which, ministerially, uh, ministerially I was very wounded. Uh, basically, you know, I had a conversation with someone, and they said they, they, this, these words to me. Why don't you just give up? Yeah. And... If you know me, and especially if you're my parent, you know that that just spurs me even harder. Like, that's exactly what I needed, but at the same time, it was very, uh, it, it caused me to have an injury as well. Now, this message today is not all about me, you know, because I don't want to ever get it to be like that. But, point being is, we get into these situations in which we no longer have the strength to move on. And it takes a village to lift up our arms and help us to move forward. Jesus, in the book, in the book of Mark, well, and also every other gospel, mentions a similar story, um, or similar stories. He gets to the point where he is trying to emphasize two things. Number one that he is who he says he is. And I've been saying that every, every week so far in December, or the last several weeks. But also because, uh, also Jesus is trying to establish that we are called, if we believe in who Jesus is, to do everything that we can to bring people to Jesus. Right. Short of sin, of course. You know. And leading a sinful life is not going to get us there. So there are two aspects. We are called to bring people to Jesus, but we are also called to bring Jesus to people. There is this twofold responsibility that we have as Christians that we are no longer, and, that, and, and actually we were never uh, intended for this in the first place, we just can't come to church and sit down in the, in the seats and uh, amen and do your prayers and that's it. We are missing something at our very core <coughs> whenever we just refuse to obey. Now, sometimes obedience looks like this. Hey, I need you to be able to sit back, and I need you to be a mentor to someone, and I need you to, to rest because I have something for you. That's, that's also obedience. Uh, other times, it's... It's the old adage that us pastors we talk about. Whenever you come to me and have this idea, then you must be the volunteer for this idea. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> wow, you look like a great person that you are willing to head that up. So just know that if you do that, that's the answer I'm going to give you. But don't be scared away from that. 
God calls us to things on a regular basis that we must be obedient to Jesus. And we will stifle our own spiritual progress unless we do. So this story is really interesting that we see in Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Because in this particular area of, of scripture, um, Mark, once again, um, jumps right into just like in the midst of this story. And we don't have a whole lot of context. Mark was my kind of guy, this, this writer. <coughs> because if you know me, I can't hardly keep my mind on one particular thought for a long period of time. And I tend to jump from thought to thought very quickly, like my mother can. Yeah. And if you look at the, the first chapter of Mark, we're not introduced with the infancy narrative, Mary and Joseph, all that kind of stuff. What we're introduced with is all of a sudden John the Baptist is walking out of the wilderness and he's, his beard is caked in honey and he smells like locust breath, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, and he has camel hair on him and he's just coming out. And the first thing he talks about is, hey, the Messiah's coming. Prepare yourself. And then what you see throughout the structure of Mark is something I love. I love. Mark is probably my favorite, favorite, favorite gospel. Because he is all about getting to the point. Every paragraph in Mark, well not every, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but most paragraphs in Mark, if you read it, it starts out with phrases like, immediately, suddenly, all of a sudden, and then it goes on to the next story. All of a sudden, Jesus goes out there, and immediately, then he does this, and then suddenly, this happened. And, you know, all these kind of things. I'm like, yes, I love this guy. Let's get to the point. Let's learn about some stuff. Doesn't give me a bunch of flowery stuff, you know, all that. I really appreciate that. Oh, I, w I wish Mark, you know, honestly would have had the... Mary and Joseph stuff, but he just jumps right in it because what, what we realize is if you look at the scholars believe that Mark was the, one of the later ones, we already know the story about uh, the virgin birth and all that kind of stuff, so, so we're, we're jumping into it. I want to I establish what Mark is saying. I want to establish that, that Jesus is the Messiah. Right. And he's so impatient with enthusiasm that he's like, okay, first things first. John comes in. He's talking to us about this Messiah coming. We already know John because he's, he's uh, gathering a bunch of disciples. A little weird guy, camel hair, beard, just d disheveled looking. But hey, he is ready to go. And then here comes Jesus walking into, onto the scene. And then suddenly this happens. He starts, he starts uh, healing people. And there's another reason why I love Mark is because he really emphasizes how much of an introvert Jesus was. If you look in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we see so many instances in which Jesus was, and this is holy because Jesus did it, by the way, he, he had healed so many people, and people were just gathering in one particular part of Mark saying the people are pressed in on him because there are just so many people around him, and he just is trying to get away from everybody, right? <clears throat> Not because he doesn't like them, but because he needs rest. So he's, he's stepping away, and we see in, in, in Mark chapter 1 that there are instances in which, you know, uh, towards the end of Mark chapter 1, we see he heals a leper. And it's not because, like, he's going out and searching for a leper. It's because he was actually going away to pray, and people started following him, and then a leper, there's a leper. And then, right before that, actually right before this, this particular story of healing the leper, it, Mark, once again, just gets right to the point. He says, and then Jesus healed a bunch of people. Other people. Can I have some details, please? <laughs> you know. But just by the very nature of who Jesus was, everywhere he went, a crowd gathered. It sounds great to some of us. But Jesus had to have some time in which he stepped back and he connected with his followers. 
He had to have some times in which he recharged. And what he realized is, well, I mean, Jesus knows everything, so realize is the wrong word here, but what we realized is that every time Jesus connected in that way, people were drawn to him. And the very nature of who he was just spilled out of him that it was almost as if he was accidentally healing people. You know, we know that's not true, but it just reads like that. The compassion that he had for people around him was just absolutely overwhelming. Someone would come to him, the leper came to him and said, hey, um, obviously you can see what's going on with me. I have leprosy. And Jesus asked him a very interesting question. Do you want to be well? Fast forward, Jesus heals him. Didn't cause much of a stir, although more people hear about it. And then we see in the, at the beginning of Mark chapter 2 is where we're at right now. I can only assume from the context from the very first word of, of uh, Mark to now that Jesus was probably just having a normal visitation with somebody, just telling them about him and the kingdom and the coming kingdom and the kingdom can be now and then. And it's not just about doing good things so that you uh, live forever and eternity. That's not what this kingdom is only about. So he's telling the story of the kingdom, and then all of a sudden we see the context here in which the house is so full of people, and, and it was actually indicated early on that the entire town of Capernaum was there, 1,500 people. Looks like that's probably what the population was. The entire town was gathered in this house, around this house, layer upon layer upon layer of people. So people talking to Jesus would have had to stay in line, wait for his attention, all those kind of things. Then we see this story come into play. Jesus trying to visit one of his buddies, telling them about the good news of the kingdom. And four guys bring their friend who can't walk. And instead of waiting in line, these guys, uh, these guys do the unthinkable. Let me ask you something. If someone today, you have this house party, right? Your house is full of people. Good hors d'oeuvres, you know, people are having a great time. And then all of a sudden you start to Start to feel drywall come down on your head. And before you know it, some people in the neighborhood have made you a makeshift skylight. Right? Just a couple weeks ago, I had spent a lot of time and some money on, on doing a, a garage project. And um, I am just not a handy person. So just the very nature of building something with my hands and, you know, having a vision for something and stepping back and seeing what it looks like was very satisfying. And I can tell you that, like, the very first time we bought a house, signed on the dotted line thinking we're going to be 180 before we pay this thing off. You know, those kind of feelings that we all have in buying a house. That I want to make sure that Everything is at tip-top condition in my home, and if anyone, large or small, um, destroys this house, I'm going to be very, very upset. I worked hard. So what would you feel like if all of a sudden you're in the midst of this party? Hey, you know, sometimes we have a party to celebrate one another. Uh, Sometimes we have a party to show off new stuff in our house, you know, housewarming or open house, whatever the case may be, very valid. You have a lot of people over, your reputation is on the line because it's your home, and all of a sudden the drywall starts to fall, and there are four guys with desperate looks on their faces cutting a hole in your roof. I think I might be a little upset. 
how much roofs cost? <laughs> Believe me, I, I know how much roofs cost. Think of a number that's more than that. You know? <laughs> I remember a few years ago, uh, we put a new roof on our house. I decided instead of hiring a company that I'd get some buddies together and we'd get some people together and we'd just do it our own. A company can come in and do it about a day, day and a half. Uh, six days later, <laughs> we got it done. We know what this is like. Homeowners or even renters, you know, we know what this is like. But these four guys had this friend and he couldn't walk. And they weren't going to take the risk of waiting around and maybe never getting to speak to Jesus. They were going to put their reputation on the line and do everything that they could to get this man to Jesus. So, maybe they put a lot of thought into it, maybe they didn't, but all they knew is that he was not well. He was not whole. And this man named Jesus that we keep hearing about, the whole town's here, so something's going on in this house, something of, of noteworthiness. We gotta get this guy over there. So they climb up to the roof, they uh, they cut the hole, they and the scripture actually says they dug the hole and they lowered him down to Jesus. Now, if the whole town is here, then we know that even the people who didn't necessarily like Jesus were there. I mean, he didn't have a 100% popularity rating there. So, the Pharisees saw this and they kind of sat back and just wondered how he was going to handle it. You see, in those days, they believed that if you were, you could walk, you were blind, you were deaf, whatever the, the ailment you might have had, maybe it would be from birth or maybe, maybe, maybe recently because of injury, it was because either you have sinned or your parents have sinned. That would have been a common cultural understanding. So even this man being lowered down would have thought, I don't know what I did, I don't know what my parents did, but I need to be redeemed. In our culture, we look at this man and say, his, his, um, the thing that is going on with him, the worst thing that could be possibly happening with this guy is he can't walk. But first of all, we, we can't start thinking like 2018 Americans when we read something like this. Let's get back into a more Eastern, ancient mentality. And that was, this guy sinned. There was something that happened, someone sinned, that's just the way it was. So we might get frustrated with Jesus, the first words out of his mouth was, your sins are forgiven, what about his legs? Isn't that the most important thing? But Jesus looks at that, and he says, that's that's not the kingdom I'm bringing. So the first words out of this guy, out of Jesus' mouth was, your sins are forgiven. The first thing this man, being lowered down, you know, the man who couldn't walk, would have thought was, a burden lifted off of his shoulders. All of his life, maybe, maybe it's all, been all of his life, all of his life he has wondered, what can I possibly do to become a whole? Who has the ability to fix me internally, externally? <clears throat> I am this way because I am this way. So that would have been an absolute big relief. Now the Pharisees heard this and the first thought was, how can this guy Jesus possibly do this? Sure, maybe he's the Messiah or whatever, but in our, in our particular cultural understanding, the Messiah isn't also God, and this is only God's jurisdiction. You can't just go around telling people that they're, they're absolved of their sin who does that. I can go give a sacrifice, and hopefully I'm absolved, 
But really, this is what made them the most angry. Second thing, well, the first thing Jesus says to them, to the rest of the crowd, is I know what you're thinking. What, what's easier, to tell them his sins are forgiven or to tell them to get up and walk? Makes me think. He wanted to get, the, get in their minds. The fact was, anybody can say you're healed and maybe someday you'll be healed, but who has the ability to say your sins are forgiven? Not anybody. He's trying to kind of tell them that I am who you think I am. In fact, even if you think I'm the Messiah, I'm actually even more than what you think the Messiah is. So, these friends risked everything. They didn't know if this guy was really going to be healed, so they may have been wasting their time, putting all of this effort, hoisting this guy up on his mat, and putting him down on the ground right in front of Jesus. They didn't know exactly, they couldn't really see through the roof, so maybe this was the right place. You know, we could be putting him in the kitchen for all we know. Maybe uh, Jesus might look at this guy and just say, why, why are you cutting in line? Get, get away from me. And that would have been actually pretty valid. We wouldn't have faulted Jesus for that. These guys were putting so many things at risk, but all they knew is that Jesus was in there. We've got to get him in there. I believe Jesus is who he is. <coughs> And there are claims in Scripture that if we were to look through it are absolutely huge, crazy claims. But I'm telling you, if one thing is true, it's all true. Right. Jesus started out, perhaps, with just a quick visitation to someone to tell them about the kingdom. But just the very nature of the message and he being who he is, gathered this huge crowd that was, that was pressing on, on him, and he, you know, in front of him and around him, was, was packing this little house, you know, it could have been the biggest house in the, in the town, who knows, packing this house and the house and area around it to the point where it said there wasn't even any room around the house. I mean, which indicates that this house wasn't just a house in the middle of nowhere, but this was a house smack dab in the middle of the town with houses around it. The very nature of Jesus approaching him means that healing is on his way. That restoration, that redemption, that getting closer to him, just being in his presence is a very healing uh, event. These four guys that came and brought their friends to Jesus were, were people who were putting everything on the line and they didn't know what the future was going to look like. They didn't even know if Jesus was going to accept him because, you know, he, he sinned or his parents sinned and that's why he's this way. The average Jewish rabbi would have said, no, you're, you've sinned, you've got to live in this. You know, you got to deal with the consequences, and nobody will love you. Go back to the street to beg. You got to make a make a uh, stay out of the way, but still find a way to get money so that you can support yourself. These guys had so much compassion on their friend; they brought him to the living God. What's our excuse? Is it our reputation? It's a well, I, I don't think he or she will accept it. It's like, well, you know, I've got things to do. I've got family. You know, I'm going to care about them. I've I got a job. I, I want to keep my job. What, what is your reputation? What, what is your thing that's keeping you from being enthusiastically uh, representative of the living Christ? We're not called to just say the prayer, 
get our uh, fire insurance, you know, and move along. Hopefully, someone will hear us listening to Christian music and say, "Well, that must be it. Must be a good Christian." <laughs> My question is: Do we desire Jesus enough that we're willing to cut a hole in someone's roof and do it? That we're willing to make others uncomfortable? Not. Not in a way that's like, hey, look at me, I'm a Christian, and everyone needs to know about it, and, um, you know, you can just get out of my way. You know, that kind of thing. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, are we willing to do exactly what God has asked us to do when he has asked us to do it? Are we open to his work around us, through us, by us? Jesus is who he says he is. Amen. And if we accept that today, then that opens up a whole universe of possibilities with this world around us. You see, D Jesus never called us to himself because he, he was saying, hey, wait, wait for heaven, man. It's going to be awesome. Although it is. He gave us the example of what we call the Lord's Prayer. He said something crazy in it. You want to hear it? But thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Hmm. He didn't say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done later on when we get to heaven. That there is this aspect of the kingdom that is meant to overlap with earth here. It's in the way we treat people. It's in the way that we bring people to Jesus and bring people to Jesus to people. It's in the way that we interact with everyone around us. In the way that we uh, can't help but with our very actions and our words to uh, display and preach and exclaim the good news. That we don't have to fight anymore. Jesus has it under control. He is who he says he is. The king is coming. The, the kingdom is overlapping with, with the world. And the kingdom overlapping the world, by the way, is Jesus. Amen. That's what Advent is all about. Advent is celebrating this very concept of two very different worlds colliding. And the middle of that is Jesus himself. <clears throat> I'm going to call the praise team back up. Let us not forsake the call that God has for us to not just be a stagnant Christian that just kind of goes about the motions and, 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 and we just kind of typically agree with the godly things that are said from time to time, or we, we, uh, we listen to Christian music, or you know, we pray before bedtime or a, a meal, but help us let, let us, let us be open to the fact that God might have something more for us. This this very kingdom, uh, this kingdom story should animate our very muscles and bones. It's amazing when we can see something as, as powerful as Jesus' words, that they have so much power. Not only did they create the universe, but they can also move our feet and animate our hands. The altars are open if you have something to confess or some praise to give. Please do that. Don't, don't wait. Um, we'll meet you back in prayer.